Open up your Bibles to Romans 16. Romans 16. And uh, we'll go through a significant uh, part of this chapter, uh, just about every verse here. And um, let's, uh, let's start in verse 1, Romans 16. The Bible says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Romans chapter 16 is the closing reflections of the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. And uh, these are his parting shots, if you will. These are the statements he's going to be making as he's closing out a rather lengthy letter. And um, it's no surprise that this particular church had meant quite a deal to him. In fact, there was a gal named Phoebe where uh, the relationship seemed to be the Apostle Paul to the Church of Rome, and then there's this secondary ministry partner in Phoebe, and he loves the Church at Rome so much, and he has such great faith and trust in them, that he tells them, there's another gal that I want you to receive, and uh, she's quite good in ministry, actually. And, and as the Bible says, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. Now, you, you don't just go ahead and do that. Uh, there, sometimes uh, you don't necessarily want worlds colliding if you feel like there might be a personality conflict. You know what I'm talking about? If you're introducing two groups of people, every once in a while you might say, well, they might interpret that this and this person conducts themselves in this way. And if we kind of connect these two people, I don't know, maybe there could be sparks flying. Well, did you know that didn't happen here? And it was because something about the church at Rome was so hospitable and so kind, and it was known by the people who are there. The title of the message is, Why a Church is Remembered. Why a Church is Remembered. So with God's help, I'd like for us to look through Romans 16 and consider this particular idea. Let's pray. We love you, Lord. We thank you for being so good to us. Lord, we thank you so much for salvation. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all your completed word you gave to us, Lord, so that we can have, uh, Lord, clarity in this life. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the local church. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for what you've done here over the years. And Lord, yet we ask for you to do more these uh, short days before your return. Father, we ask that you would Fill the message, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, of course, help myself, Lord, but help us to hear, would the Holy Spirit be our teacher today and would be our preacher today, and Lord, that we would get something to apply to our lives, both the sinner and the saint, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you ever decide to go into ministry, there's a couple of practical paths you're going to have to walk through. One of them is basically universal advice that you should probably do some sort of internship, if not two, before you enter into the ministry. I had graduated from our Bible Institute here in 2012 and just looking for the next step, so to speak. And one of those steps was quite practical and just about anyone that I asked had given this specific advice, go into a low-level stress situation, you should do an internship at a church or in some sort of ministry. And so I began to look for internships, uh, whether they were in town or whether they were out of state or whatever the case may be, and the Lord crossed my paths with an evangelist, and I never necessarily thought that I would go into itinerant work in that capacity, but the Lord seemed to be in it. And, uh, and I got my feet wet for uh, about three months traveling with a full-time evangelist and living that life. It was quite interesting, actually. And um, me, I've, I've always been kind of a homebody, and I would go through these uh, emotional shifts every time we went to a new church. I kept thinking about the, the process of unpacking and packing, and, and uh, it, was quite a, it was quite a character growth moment for me, and uh, a little embarrassing at times. There were churches where literally, uh, I remember pulling into the driveway, and I started getting choked up thinking about all the things I had to do just to get my schedule in a row. It was very, very much taking a fish out of water, and, and I have to tell you, I learned a significant thing. 
But one of those things that was incredibly uh, blessed about this trip was meeting other churches. I mean, meeting other brothers and sisters in Christ. It was so exciting to me. Uh, meeting other uh, places across the South, some in Ohio and some primarily in the, in the southern uh, part of our United States through, through Georgia and through Tennessee and through Texas and through all sorts of places and West Virginia, of course. Um, and so it was truly an eye-opening experience for me. You know, uh, one of the things that I learned about these churches is that the people are who you remember. It was the people. It wasn't necessarily the facilities, though may, they may have uh, been something to admire for sure. In West Virginia, I met a pastor uh, years ago at that internship where he served his congregation so much to the effect that he would even do their taxes for them. Well, that was really, really something. It was, I mean, every church has a different personality. Right outside of Philadelphia was another ministry. And uh, it was, uh, I couldn't imagine so many well-behaved kids in church, about 50 or so, that would just sit quietly by themselves. It was really shocking. It was really shocking. Uh, but I have to say, it was certainly a blessing to see the next generation of young people in that particular church. In Columbus, I encountered a church that it, it struck me how, how well that the congregation knew deep doctrine. And, I, and I, not that I'm confessing to know deep doctrine necessarily, but it struck me that the people themselves didn't just relegate that to the pastor himself, but also to themselves, that they took it upon themselves to study deeply the word. There's another church actually in Texas. This was really something. It reminded me so much of home. They put on a missions conference. And this missions conference uh, felt so homey. And uh, there, was, there was such care and such hospitality to the missionary families and to the people themselves that I just walked away thinking this is how a true gentleman should be. And this is how, how true hospitality should look like. And I have to say, it was at that time I really missed home. I really did. It's the strangest thing. Before this trip, I always thought I would remember the buildings. And I always thought I would remember the facilities, because I like those things. And maybe even the cities. I've always been sort of a city guy. But it wasn't the cities, and it wasn't the towns, and the things that they had to offer that I remembered. It was the people. And, and I still remember them 11 years later. It was the people. The church at Rome was a called-out assembly of born-again, baptized believers carrying out the Great Commission and as the Apostle Paul closes out this letter, he reflects on the very testimony of these people. We're reminded of 2 Corinthians 3, 2, where the Bible says, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of men. Because the truth is, the Roman church was not known for its facilities, and it was not known for how well they kept the grounds. Those are important, certainly. But it was known for the people. It was known for those people. In fact, the church today is primarily known because of its members. Yes, you might have a nice building, and we are certainly thankful. We never want to undercut the blessings that God has given us here. But when you go out into the world and you say, I go to Cleveland Baptist Church, people are thinking of you because you are a member here. Because ye are our epistle, known and read of men. A church is known by its people. Amen. So the question then becomes, why? is a church remembered for its people. Well, turn your uh, eyes to verse 17 to 18. And the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, for they are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. A church is known and remembered for its unity isn't it? Or at least a time in its church history where it was unified for a goal. Maybe the Great Commission, maybe some sort of project, but you walk into a place like that and you, you just get a sense of it, that there seems to be a unifying idea about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and, and a unifying idea and sentiment about what the Word of God is. It is very, the very words of God himself. The space of church unity effectively is bordered then by the lines of division, 
Because as the Apostle Paul is looking at the church of Rome, he says, look, I want you guys to kind of watch out for people that are against the doctrine of the Bible. And, and I want you to watch out for people that seem to have a type of maliciousness about them. And I want you to watch out for the people because because here, with, with, with fair speeches and good words, it's like these guys are articulate and they know how to effectively communicate a negative idea. The Apostle Paul says, I want you to mark those people because they are causing division in your church. This could be fully well characterized by a basketball game. Say, what? How could that be? Well, I do like basketball, but I'll explain how. Basketball needs the rules. I mean, it needs the rules. And if it doesn't have the rules, basketball is awful. <laughs> it really is. If you enter a pickup basketball game and you got a guy running with the ball and some guy elbowing you in the head thinking that's part of the game, you promise you, you don't want to play. I promise. Like, I've been in those games several times and I'm usually the guy throwing the elbows and people don't want to play with me. But that's how it is. <laughs> but you know, in basketball, there are out-of-bounds lines. That's like a line of division. And there are rules in basketball that need to be followed to the best of the referee's ability. Some guy interpreting the very rules themselves. Well, if those lines of division, the second that you step out of those lines, then you're effectively out. And that's what the Bible's saying. When you step across those divisional lines, you're marked. It's an offense. And what God is saying is, if you want to break unity, then go ahead and step out of bounds. Because you'll be marked. And isn't that a hallmark of our church? Man, we've been unified for 65 years. Together. And, and perhaps over the years, there could have been maybe a visitor here or there that desired to be malicious in some way. And I'm so thankful God has protected us. Amen. The basic doctrine of the Bible, salvation, the Trinity, eternal security, heaven and hell, kindness, love for God and your neighbor. You know what the Lord is saying? If anybody is against those things, I want you to mark them. Amen. And I want you to show that this is great offense to me. Because you know why a church is remembered? If and only it is unified. It must be that way. It must be that way. Well, why else would a church be then remembered? By its general obedience to the God. By its general obedience to God. The Bible says this in Romans 16, 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. I mean, notice how the testimony of these people, that their faithful obedience, it went out to all men. That there was something in the community that seemed to say, boy, that church, they really are obedient to the Lord. Years ago, my, my mom had mentioned that I was in the Bible Institute uh, to somebody, and and uh, this was a, let's say, more secular thinker, let's say. This is a nice person overall. And they said, where, where are you studying? Where is your son studying? So, oh, he's studying at Cleveland Baptist Church. And they went, oh, that place is strict. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Well, because we think the Bible's the word of God. Amen. We don't really apologize for that. And we want people to agree with us, <laughs> quite honestly. That general obedience gets shed abroad, doesn't it? The Bible says to be obedient in the good things. Like, I mean, just simple things, whatever that would be. That generalized obedience, and yet also simple towards evil things. Like there, we're striking the balance between the two, is what the, what the Bible's saying. Is that, yes, we're, we're effectively trying to uh, continue in righteous living, and we're aware of the world. I mean, it's, it's not like we're not aware of what's happening in the world. But the idea is we're supposed to be simple towards those things. Generalized obedience. Came across this uh, story here. It's an interesting story. There was a man who worked all his life, had saved all his money, but was very stingy. Just before he died, he said to his wife, when I die, I want you to take all my money and put it in the casket with me. I want to take my money to the afterlife with me. And so, 
He got his wife to promise. Well, he died. He was stretched out in the casket, his wife sitting there, dressed in black, and her friends sitting next to her. When they finished the ceremony, and just before the undertaker gets to close the casket, the wife said, wait just a moment. And she had a small box with her. She came over with the box and put it in the casket. Then the undertakers locked the casket and rolled the body away. Her friend said, sweetheart, I know you weren't foolish enough to put that money in there with your husband. And the loyal wife said, listen, I am a Christian. I can't go back on my word. I promised that I was going to give him the money in the casket with him. You mean to tell me that that money's in the casket with him? I indeed it is. I got it all together. I put it in my account. I wrote a check, and he can cash it if he wants to spend it later on. <laughs> you know, there is like a beautiful simplicity in obedience, is there? Just a, an absolute beautiful... And, you know, honestly, you know, I, I, I love my country, but it's, it's how we're wired, isn't it? You know, th this country is based on freedom for the individual and, and freedom of thought. And <laughs> if you're like me, and I know that you're a Clevelander, so you at least sound like me, um, when people tell you to do something, you usually want to start with, yeah, well, why don't you make me? <laughs> or, or people say, like, well, you should go ahead. And, oh, yeah, well, how come why? They always wanna, you always want to question everything. It's because how we are as Americans... I really hope that the Lord will have grace in this area when we meet him day to day. It's like, Lord, we, we can't help it. We were a, a freedom-seeking and loving people. But I think that even though we are a freedom-seeking and loving people, the Lord still expects this level of obedience for the simple things. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be that obey not the gospel of God? You see, a church is remembered for its unity, and it is remembered for its generalized obedience. But there's something else that the church is remembered for. Go to verse 3. A church is remembered by what it does. A church is remembered by what it does. The Bible says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You know, you'll never forget somebody who risked themselves trying to tell you about Jesus Christ. Maybe you were led to the Lord by a coworker. And listen, most jobs don't really want you sharing the gospel there. It's uh, typically frowned upon unless you have a very loose environment at your place of employment, and yet maybe it was a coworker that brought you to church, and yet maybe it was somebody that told you about Jesus Christ, about how you can be saved. Do you know that they risked it for you? They certainly did. They risked it for you. Do you know that sometimes to stand up for righteousness, it is truly a risk, and, and maybe even one day a great persecution could fall upon the church as we know it, and it would be a type of risk. You know, you never forget those people willing to make those risks. You know who else you don't forget? The people who opened up their house for prayer. Romans 16, 5, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. You know, maybe, maybe it's not a house for you. Or maybe it's whoever is constantly flipping that fellowship hall 15 times a week to turn it into a theater, or turn it into a dining hall, or turn it into a chapel. Or maybe, maybe you're like me. You grew up in the college class around here, and you remember families like the Recitos opening up their house day in, day out, week in, week out. And as we learned from God's word and made deep friendships, maybe you remember the person who opened up his house to you. Or what about you remember the people who just work so hard? Verses 6 and 12, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Verse 12, Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord, salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. You know, if you come to a basketball game here at Heritage Christian School, at the end of the game, you're going to see someone sweeping up. You're going to see someone picking up gum wrappers everywhere. It's somebody that thinks it's important enough to work for this place. You remember the people and what they do. 
Romans 16, 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. You remember the people who suffered along your side. You remember the people who bore with you, who took on a difficult task, and they spent long hours working with you. Verses 8 through 9. Greet Ampilius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. You remember the people who helped you and who you loved in the Lord. Verse 10. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' house. You remember those people who seem to conquer a difficult task in their life. And they, they prove themselves. Verse 11. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. You remember the people who are like near kin to you here. It's like they're more than family. It's the people here. Verse 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. You remember the people mentioned in the same breath as your family. Notice how the apostle's mom goes to this church. Look at the last part of the verse. Salute Rufus, chosen of the Lord, and his mother and mine. He's talking about his own mother. You remember the people that are mentioned in the same breath with your family. Verse 14. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and Petrobus and Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philoglus and Julia and Neris and his sister and Olympus and all the saints which are with them. You know what else you remember? Random groups of church people, just because they were faithful to each other. Let me take you to a Sunday evening at Cleveland Baptist Church, where people are meandering around for like an hour afterwards when Bill Yeager is getting angry and he wants to turn the lights off. I mean, pockets of people, pockets of people talking day in, day out. What are you doing this week? How was your week? Can I pray with you? People talking about who knows what, cracking jokes, those types of people. Verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, and salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Cordus, a brother. You remember even other church members who helped you with another ministry. You know, a church is just remembered by what it does. And it's remembered because those people are doing those things. And those people are unified. And those people are have demonstrating some generalized obedience. And those people, in fact, are doing something for God. You know, preaching and teaching is so critically important. I mean, it's, it's how we convey the, the thoughts and mind of God. It's what takes you through the week. But isn't it strange how not even preaching and teaching is mentioned in this particular chapter. It's because it's the people. Because you remember them. What makes the Church of Rome so special is not just because people remember it, but because God himself remembered the church. Verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God, only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What makes a church memorable to the Lord is that they exercised simple obedience of faith. Now look, what's going to make a church memorable in the community is if it is unified, if there's like a generalized obedience, and of course just simply the things they do. They, they feel like a family. But what makes a church memorable to God is that there was a point in their life where they individually trusted the Lord as their Savior. If you're sitting here today and you don't know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I want to just kind of park here for just a moment. Did you understand that you're a sinner? 
The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. We have all sinned. The Bible says, or all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whether you lied, whether you cheated, whether you did something unspeakable, you've sinned this way or that way, and that's what separates you from God. Sin is our very problem. The Bible says that sin has to be punished. It is a holy God that we are standing before. The wages of sin is something called death. Death in the Bible is different than just biological death. It is the understanding that, yes, I will die someday, but death, according to the Bible, has two interpretations. One, the biological, and yes, the spiritual. The Bible calls hell the second death. So sin is your problem, and hell is the consequence of your sin, my friend. It's not just because God hates you. It's because he is holy. And in fact, he loves you. Because the answer to your problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. And did you know Jesus Christ is God? Something we will never apologize saying? Something that is that generalized obedience? Like, like we will never, we will never say that he's not. Never. You will never hear that here. And because, because God really does love you. I mean, he really does love you. So sin is our problem. Hell is the consequence of those sins. And Jesus, God, came to earth for you. Amen. And he lived 30 years in relative obscurity. In the last three years of his life, he decided to start a public ministry. And in that time, he did many wonderful things. But the most important thing that he did was taking your sins on his back as he died on a cross on his own will and he was buried and rose up on the third day. Amen. Sin is your problem. Hell is your consequence. And my friend, Jesus is your answer. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you saved today? I pray that you are. Because in the end, we're talking about what makes a good church. But you're really not part of this church unless you're saved. And that's the pattern of the entire Bible. We're happy you're here. We want you to come back. We want you to stay. Please, make sure you go to the visitor center and do the QR code. I'll just get to know what I'm talking about. Man, we love you. And, and we want you to stay. But it doesn't end there. That's how, what takes you to heaven. But what makes you in God's will is then getting baptized. The Bible says... In Acts 2, 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And what the Bible is trying to tell you is, this is God's will for your life. You get saved, and then you get baptized. So if you're sitting here, and you're saved, but you're not baptized, I want to plead with you, you should get baptized. No, the thief on the cross died without getting baptized. There are plenty of people that have died over the years without getting baptized that went straight to heaven. It's not a means for salvation, but it is a means for God's will. And it is a means for how God will judge you one day. It's because he wants you to be saved absolutely because he loves you, but he also wants you to follow him in like a generalized obedience. Because you're, you're simple towards the evil and you are wise towards the good. And the good is identify in baptism. Jesus was baptized and so should you be. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing to be baptized. But that's not all. What makes a church a church is that one day that baptism takes them in to the membership of this local body. The Bible says in the same day there were added unto them 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. 1,000, excuse me. And so are you saved, my friend? Are you baptized today? And are you a member of this church? Look, we want you to be a member here. And if you don't want to be a member here, be a member somewhere else. We want you to be a member. Because we want you to be right with the Lord. Well, we're a little partial to this one, of course, you know. But the things that you do begin to matter because you have checked off all the boxes of simplicity. Like he starts to remember all your labor. And he starts to remember the times you took a risk for him. And he starts to remember the times that you've spent alongside somebody else on a task. And he starts to remember the times you were persecuted. And he starts to remember those things. Because the Bible says that one day, not just a unified church, not just a church with generalized obedience, and not just a church that remembers 
the, that is remembered by God simply because it is doing good things, but because you obeyed the Lord for his will for your life. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 16, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. This is a promise to Christians, people that are, are saved and going to heaven. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Can I shorten that up just a little bit? You're going to meet the Lord, and if you're saved, and if you're baptized, and you're a member of this church, you should be serving him. Because you're going to meet the Lord face to face someday. And that's not allegory. And that's not myth. You really will look at him in the eyes. And all of a sudden, he'll remember all those works that you did. Oh, yeah, you, you taught that Sunday school lesson. Oh, yeah, you had that bus route. Oh, yeah, you used to cook all the time for every meal they had at that church. Oh, yeah, you did this thing. Oh, yeah, you sang specials. Oh, yeah, you're in the choir. Oh, yeah, you did that nursing home ministry. Whatever the case may be, it is brought up before God himself, and it will be tried by fire. Why? Because you and I are in Romans 16, aren't we? And imagine the Bible is being written today. Would it say our name? Would it say our name that we served the Lord? That we served Him with gladness and with a sincerity? So today, I'm not here to tell you I know God's will specifically for all the things you should do. But I know this much. I know you should get saved. And I know you should be baptized. And I know you should at least join a church, if not this one. Come be a part of something that will last forever. That will last for eternity when you meet the Lord. In closing, I, uh, I remember saying goodbye to the, the last church. And it was this, uh, this church right outside Philly. Kind of a smaller church. Really good people. Really good people. And um, it was the church that I mentioned uh, a moment ago with uh, exciting children's ministry. Just uh, sweet kids, sweet kids. And I remember saying goodbye to these kids. And, you know, you got to understand, I had very little attachments in my life at that point. Not married, single, no kids, of course. And, um, and, and I'm saying goodbye to these people. And, uh, and I'm not thinking necessarily about all the opportunities I had. I'm taking a look at the pastor's kids, and they are asking their dad, can we take him to McDonald's? <laughs> can, we, can we just go take him to McDonald's? And the dad's like, you know, kind of had enough of me. He goes, oh, I think he's done for the night. <laughs> you know, that, that's right. And, um, and I remember one of the kids, they say this, we're never going to see him again. And I just say, 10-year-old girl. We're never going to see him again. You want to know why? Because a church is remembered for the very people and what they did with God's word. Amen. And I'm, I'm sitting back here, man, 11 years later. 11 years later. And, and I'm reflecting on, on a crazy internship where I, I drove behind a fifth wheel in my 03 Grand Am. It was nuts. And you know the thing that I remember? The people. I remember the people. A church is remembered by people, and God remembers the people that trusted him. Where are you today? And I just want to challenge you. Are you saved today? Have you been baptized are you a member of this church? And what are you doing about it?